What's going on guys? My name is Jimmy House and today we're going to talk about how I specifically rehab my own knee injury without surgery, without peptides, without steroids, without stem cells to get back to deadlifting 800 pounds, to training with New Wave, the best jujitsu team in the world, how I did that, what happened, and everything in between. So as the clip plays here above, you'll see that a very unfortunate training accident occurred between myself and one of my best friends back home. I'm gonna start off by saying he's one of the most safest, well-controlled training partners I've ever had, and that was a complete accident, and I don't regret a second ever training with him, so let's get that out of the way. But acknowledging that accidents happen in the sport, and things like that just happen as two very high level guys come together and training intensely, you know, that's one of the possibilities. So basically what happened there, I had a full PCL tear based on the MRI, partial ACL tear, three partial MCL tears. So my MCL tore in three separate places. And then I also somehow fractured my femur. Now, not to the extent that I'm like walking, like with my ankle poking out sideways like that, but to the extent that like something happened in there as we landed. So you see us coming in, the knee comes in here this way. That's where I felt like one or two kind of like pops or, or tears occur. And then as we landed, basically like in this position, he landed like this on my knee and then obviously my body weight coming down. So that's about 270 pounds of his own weight. Uh, the momentum of my body weight and then from standing to, to the floor, that's, that's essentially how I hurt my knee. So the first thought was, that was it. That, that was the knee injury that everyone talks about. Like I'm done, like I'm gonna have to get surgery and, and God knows what's gonna happen after the surgery occurs. From my experience, I've seen two really bad knee injuries. And in both cases, as soon as the person tried to stand up and put weight on it themselves, it immediately buckled and they couldn't support themselves. So acknowledging that my friend, that's this 275 pound beast, launched himself into my knee and we both collapsed on it. I thought for sure, like there's no way I'm getting up from this. There's no way that I'm not gonna need surgery. But he stands me up and he's like, all right, okay, I'm gonna take pressure off your hands now. And on both feet, somehow I wasn't collapsing. And then I was like, that's interesting. So then I went one leg and I was able to somehow support myself with one leg even immediately after the injury. So like, okay, well, that's a good sign. So after I kind of cleaned myself up a bit, and then my friend drove me home. I willed myself to get up the stairs all by myself somehow. And then that's generally where the day after that, and the next few days became tougher because that's where the adrenaline wore off, the stiffness kicked in, you name it. But in my head though, because of all the stuff that I've done for myself, my clients specifically in the world of like ATG and knees over toes guy, I took those basic principles took the level that I was at right before the injury and do, did an extreme regression going from doing super heavy sled work to essentially just walking backwards, which is what we're gonna talk about in the video. So in the video, what we're gonna show is all the exercises I did nearly in order in order to heal my knee without surgery. I'm gonna talk about some of the roadblocks I hit and how I overcame those. And I'm also gonna to touch on some of the new nuances of rehab that I learned along the way outside of the ATG movements that also paid a huge dividend in me getting back to 100%. Hope you guys enjoy the video. So one of the other things that I used to help with the rehab first was Voodoo Floss. Now, I know you guys have a lot of people in the past that have talked about it, that have used it. Unfortunately, we don't have one today, but I'll basically get, kind of walk you guys through what I did. So. Voodoo floss is essentially a really thin band that acts as like knee wrap essentially like you would for heavy squats, but it's thin enough to allow movement, but it's tight enough to uh, encourage blood flow to the area and also support the area <clears throat> so that you can get more range of motion than you could had it not been on. So for example, some of the other things that I did in the rehab journey that I can't necessarily show you right now was I would wrap myself with the voodoo floss and I would start with simple quad extensions, as well as laying flat on the ground and envision voodoo floss on my leg here, but basic hamstring curls here from the ground. Those are two of the basic ones that I did. Another thing that I did was utilizing a hot tub or a swimming pool, and because the water naturally kind of takes off some of your weight, the voodoo floss naturally allowed me to squat pretty deep in the pool and also kind of helped reintroduce ranges of motion and get blood flow to the area without much risk of injury. So I would get in a hot tub and I would do like a, a regressed HED split squat, or I would get in a hot tub and do like squats like so, or I would even get in the hot tub and just do flutter kicks until my quads burned, right? 
And that's kind of the cool thing about the rehab stuff is, for one, I'm no knee expert at all. I'm not a doctor, I'm not a therapist, I'm not any of those things, but I did build a lot of experience trying different things that I felt helped me. And so the main principle that you'll gather from all this is movement is all healing. And so if you can incorporate movement, it almost doesn't necessarily matter how you're doing so, as long as you're progressing it pop properly and acknowledging where the knee is lacking. So for example, when I go on to this stuff over here, my main issue uh, by the first month was that I still couldn't fully extend my leg. I was able to bend my leg a little bit more after time, but this was about as much as I could actually extend my leg. I couldn't get it to here just yet. So that's where a lot of the banded exercises that I learned from my friend Luke Lewis helped, especially this TKE squat that I'll show you here. The idea behind this is that you're using the band as a form of feedback to give your knee to allow it to actually push against something into extension. So this was one of the ones I hammered really heavy off the get-go that allowed that extension to return, return to my normal ability. So the premise here is I'm letting my heel come up, I'm starting on my toes, and using an appropriate band difficulty, I'm basically just slamming my heel down and thinking about flexing my quad really hard. If I need to make it hard on my step back a little bit more, the more I can let it pull my knee for, forward, naturally a little bit more range of motion, but I'm just slamming my heel down and contracting my quad, holding at the top. And that hold is what really kind of helped unlock that extension again. Again, when you get to a point where your body says stop, and you slowly are like, hey, it's okay, you gotta communicate to your body. It, it sounds kinda weird, but you gotta say, hey, like this, this is okay, like we're, we're safe here again. The main reason, besides the obvious of injury, why your body would prevent you from getting into a split or keeping straight legs on a deadlift or whatever the case may be, is really, it's your body's signal of telling you that you're not prepared or able to get into this range of motion. But considering at one point in time before the injury, I was able to do a complete knee bend just like so. I know I can do it, but I got to reintroduce the idea to my body that it's okay and we can work to get back to normal over time. If you choose to not do that at all, that's when the recovery process can be a lot longer and maybe surgery might be required at some point. But it's important to be very proactive from the get-go and start nailing these things and give your, body's re your body reasons to get better. That's the most important thing. Another thing that I did was what's called a Spanish squat, where you put your knees inside of the band and basically just use the band to counterbalance a little bit. This kind of is similar to the, the aspect that you get squatting in a pool, but this helps take some weight off and lets you get a little bit lower than you could without it. Let's say without the band, I could probably squat to about right here. With the band, I was able to get to about right here. And then you're just doing timed holds from this position. One aspect of knee training that ATG doesn't, ATG doesn't cover as much is the isometric strength and how to build the strength back in your tendons and ligaments through just holding positions. That's the element that I really appreciated learning from Luke. Another thing is taking, say, like the first half of an ATG split squat, but now just holding a position to where pretty much 99% of your weight's on your lead leg. You're doing a knee over toe shin angle here and you're just holding this position. And you can see, even though my knee's healed again, this is hard, this, this causes me to shake. That's where this pull comes into play. So you can use the pull as much or as little as you want. The goal over time would be to really only use this for balance. So I'll start to let go of the pull at a certain point and just focus on building my isometric strength right here. And naturally, even though the other knee's okay, it's always smart to evenly work both legs as well. And that's the biggest thing that I came to appreciate in my process was I went into it understanding the principles of knees over toes and ATG that got me so far, but I was also able to accumulate a lot of knowledge in other realms of rehab, such, such as stuff like this that he does with a lot of his athletes, Luke, and that also helped me progress a lot farther. So now let's get into the last few roadblocks that I hit before I got to the point to where I could fully lift heavy again and fully do jujitsu again. So initially when I first had the injury, I had to wear a brace, otherwise it was, it was a little bit too, not unstable, but just very weak. And I, and I could feel the muscles on my legs really start to wear out way faster than normal. So I wore a brace and I remember going to the gym the day after it happened. And again, you know, Ben Patrick talks about regardless of what level you're at, most everybody can probably walk backwards to some degree. You know, he takes elderly women and has them walk backwards and that progresses to like a backward sled. 
So in my case, after just occurring the knee injury, my ability level was that of a very elderly person or you know, elderly woman, not to discriminate against gender here. But my thought was, okay, we got an uphill turf, I'm limping, so we're just gonna start like this, like this. And this is about what it looked like. Now, after doing that for a couple of days, the next progression was, initially I started with the brace, but this time, take the brace off. I'm still limping, but I progressed because I took the brace off. So I'm having a little bit more weight on that leg. That naturally progressed to a sled without weight, which was probably no more than like maybe 10, 15 pounds or so. And then I progressed that week after week and I noticed my strength in the sled came back really fast. And what the sled did, it didn't necessarily heal my entire knee injury, but it rebuilt the foundation that's needed to do the other exercises that are gonna be beneficial in rehabbing your knee. For example, at a certain point, I gotta be able to do, we'll talk about it, an ATG split squat, right, without restriction, or I gotta be able to squat down all the way to this level without restriction. But I can't get to that point unless, again, we build that foundation of strength, conditioning, you name it, with something like a sled. Repetitive steps, having light impact, but enough impact to encourage a stimulus that helps rehab, gets blood flow to the area, strengthens the muscles surrounding the knee. So now, if you take a sled, just like I'm gonna do right here and progress that, just like Ben Patrick talks about, you can do this in a bunch of different ways. My personal favorite is to have a, a strap similar to this that you can kind of trust fall into. And from here, you don't really have to think about too much. The main cues I think about are, again, leaning into the strap, keeping the majority of my tension on my big toe. That's gonna activate the quad a little bit better. Specifically, we get into technical jargon here. This is the teardrop of the quad, as most people know. The specific term, the VMO, or the vastus medialis oblique. And so this is gonna be the muscle that we're trying to strengthen and condition in order to increase athleticism, build knee durability, stuff like that. So a lot of times when beginners do something like this, they'll take their steps back. A lot of times I see their knees kind of abduct a little bit, turn out. And it's not that this wouldn't be beneficial, but we could increase the quality rep a little bit if we had a slight adduction or internal rotation of the hip that keeps the majority of the tension on the big toe, which then gives a little bit more of a stimulus for this part of the quad. So whenever I'm teaching people this, I'm teaching knees in, pressure on the big toe and push off the big toe generally into extension and then just build some momentum. So as you see each rep, I'm going into extension of the knee as I'm pushing and pushing and pushing. And think about each step as a rep. The way I progress these, obviously with weight, sets, I also generally go by time or distance. So if you have a quantifiable way to measure how far you're dragging a sled, that's a great way. Or if you don't, just measure yourself by time, sets of 15 seconds, 20 seconds. Being able to pull heavy weight for 30 seconds or more at the time without your quads cramping up is a pretty rare ability that most people don't have and it probably signifies that you have a pretty good starting point in regards to your knee ability. So now, as we move on to the next exercise in the knees over toe program that I feel like covered the most ground for me, we have the Nordic curl and for a quad focus exercise, the ATG split squat and a heel elevated goblet squat was my two favorites. But in regards to the hamstrings, Nordic curl was my favorite, but you'll probably see, we'll link it here somewhere, and Seema, Josh Setledge, and I did a full Nordic curl tutorial video. And that's definitely something that I would check out in regards to the third ATG exercise that I really feel like helped me in my progress, specifically in rehabbing the, the uh, weakness behind my knee where the PCL and ACL tore. That's where the Nordic curl is gonna hit. So the next thing, for the ATG split squat, we have like three levels here essentially. The highest, the higher you elevate your lead leg, the easier it is, the lower you get to the ground, the harder it is. The reason why at first it's beneficial for me to elevate my lead leg with the injury, lack of range of motion and lack of strength in a in range position is because elevating my lead leg naturally distributes more of my weight on my back leg, which means I'm becoming less of my own body weight towards the end of this rep here, right? And so me just working this range of motion, even though it's not the entirety of my body weight, will promote pro progress and promote growth. As soon as I get to the point to where I can maintain a straight back leg 
and close off the distance between my hamstring and my calf, which is either done by sending your knee far forward over your toe while keeping your heel down or letting your knee come forward like so to get that closure and that, that type of tension that you feel at the very bottom here, like this, where there's a lot of pressure and stress on the knee. In a, in, in a controlled environment, that's essentially what you kind of want to introduce yourself to slowly over time because that's, that's a stimulus that really gives your, reason, your knee a reason to heal. If you get more so into technical jargon again, when you go into deep ranges of motion like that and the joint is under a certain level of stress, that's essentially the type of stimulus that's needed to send what's called synovial fluid to the joint, which essentially is the type of fluid that sends like the nutrients and whatnot that's needed to not only make you stronger in your muscles, but to also help heal and strengthen ligaments and tendons over time. So that's a key point. And you'll see that same point applied with a lot of different exercises. Naturally, as I get past that level, I move down, boom. And then eventually I'm at the point to where I can do all the way to the ground with a straight back leg. And if I want to close off this space, then I roll up on my toe a little bit and push back up to a starting position. You can start to weigh that over time, but that's the idea. Now, one bilateral movement that we can do, because that, be, that would be considered more unilateral per leg, is this heel elevated goblet squat, which at the beginning, I had to progress first with range of motion, then by just doing body weight and then adding weight in over time. So for example, at the beginning, with minimal forward knee travel, I could squat decently low, like probably about like this low. But the more I send my knee far forward, naturally the more pressure's on my knee. So if I went to a slant board like this and I try to squat just as low, normally I would stop about like right here. And that would be the roadblock that I had to overcome. So when you run into situations like that, where you find your body is refusing to let you in a deeper range of motion, my best advice is to treat it as if it was like a stretch and accumulate time in the deepest position that you can get into possible without pain. So for me, let's say this is like week two or three, I'm doing a heel elevated goblet squat and this is as far as I can go right? I send my knees forward and then my knees like, nope, nothing past this. So then it's a matter of accumulating time in this position. Week after week, maybe week five, week six, you see I'm getting like here. Oh, we're getting some progress. My hamstring's finally touching my calf. This is good. Eventually we get to the point all the way to where I can sit comfortably on my calves now in a full range squat position with my knees sending forward like so. And then we just progress that with a weight, whether it's a barbell, dumbbell, this bell, grip, grip, grip o bell. And it's the same thing with the weight in front, we get a little bit more weight on the quads. And now we're able to not only work that range of motion, but redevelop the strength that was lost through the injury by doing this elevated like so. I also talked about one time where you can actually make this a segmented squat. So depending upon your ankle mobility, you may find that even though your heels are elevated, you might be able to only go down this much because like your ankle mobility currently stops you. So outside of working on your ankle mobility to improve on that, you can segment it. So go down as far as you can without your heels lifting, hold. And then if you need to, let your heels come up and chill down here to get even more closure and flexion on the knee and rebuild. Those are the two main knees over toes exercises that I did to help rebuild the strength of my knee, including the Nordic curl, again, with the video that I talked about earlier. What we're gonna do next is talk about some of the banded rehab exercises that I did taught to me by Luke Lewis that also helped bring full range of motion back to the knee. Even through all the exercises that we've talked about, I still ran into some roadblocks at the end that made me very concerned on whether or not I would ultimately have to get surgery to return to my athletic capability. And so a lot of the things I ran into, specifically now going back to the Nordic curl, even as my knee progressed in range of motion and the pain went away and the strength came back, if I tried to do a Nordic curl, that was the one that I saw the least amount of progress in, despite the fact that I was still attempting to do it once or twice a week. And so that concerned me a lot because I knew the full PCL tear was one of those things where if you look it up online, 
it says that you know if the knee is able to stabilize itself, then you may not always need surgery, and the PCL is one of those that doesn't necessarily need surgery if it's fully torn. It's one of the few that doesn't. But I was afraid that I would be on the other end of that spectrum where I would ultimately need it, and I felt that because of the fact that I couldn't go down in the Nordic curl without feeling extreme tightness behind my knee, I thought that maybe I would be one of those cases. But then, something as simple as acknowledging, wow, I had a traumatic knee injury, there's probably a fair amount of scar tissue that built up in the area. What if I just try to break apart that, <laughs> through myofascial release, some of that scar tissue, and see if that does anything? So I had my awesome girlfriend at home, Lawson, just take a lacrosse ball or something similar to this and just basically just dig in behind my knee where I felt the knot was the tightest. For example, there was, a, there was like a knot like right here that at the touch was very, very tender. It's like, oh, that's an issue. So then I just started every single day digging into it, whether it be myself or Lawson. In fact, Mark showed me this the other day, which I found to be really cool, taking something that's cushiony, like an ab wheel handle, putting it between your knee like so, and putting pressure on it at your own will, and just kind of digging into the area with your own body weight. I noticed that also helped a lot with getting blood flow to the area too. I almost wish I knew about that earlier. But the main idea here is when an injury occurs, especially something like that, there's probably a fair amount of scar tissue that builds up, right? And sometimes that scar tissue, just like in other areas, can prevent certain functions or certain ranges of motion. And I was just kind of ignorant to that, uh, acknowledging like, oh, well, if I just do knees over toes movements, then that's gonna get me there. And it did. And if I kept doing it, even as, as persistent as I was, I probably would have still made it. But I noticed a huge boost in progress when I actually just started digging into my knee. And it wasn't just behind, I just I also dug into the side, I dug in up front with where a lot of the inflammation was, to the side here with the MCL tore, like right underneath the VMO. There's really no limit, in my opinion, to what you can break apart over there. And you know, at a certain point, if you start with that and do nothing, that probably won't do much to fix the issue. But in my case, after I kind of laid the groundwork of all the other rehab movements, doing something like that helped rejuvenate a lot of my progress again. So that was, that was huge. So just digging in and, and spending time each and every day breaking apart scar tissue. Now, the last part of the knee rehab process that I haven't really covered yet was one, if you're a jujitsu athlete or any athlete for that matter, starting to microdose your sport. So for example, with jujitsu, when I moved to Austin, Texas, and I started with my, with my new team, New Wave, I would go about two times a week if I felt good, three. And I would separate like one day on, two days off, one day on, two days off, microdose. And being in that environment added a, a stimulus that helped allow me to rehab and get readjusted to a lot of the jujitsu specific positions and movements that would be hard to replicate otherwise. Another thing on top of that too, is just acknowledging that jujitsu being a, a, a decently high impact sport, right, is grappling. There's an element of say impact that you have to kind of get reaccustomed to in order to also get yourself back to full capabilities of the knee. So one thing that I didn't really pay much effort into uh, during the majority of the process until the very end was just my ability to jog, my ability to run, my ability to jump, my ability to land, right? I said this on the podcast, but if you had me climb up to the Empire State Building and jump off, when I land, I will probably die and I will probably blow out my knee. However, if I started off the knee injury and just said, I'm gonna jump off this one inch and land on my bad leg, boom, here. Maybe at first it's like, oh, that's weak. But over time, this becomes something that you can actually build up. Now maybe you just start doing timed reps like this, nice and easy on a pad, nice and easy. Over time, you start to jump, 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 and test your ability to brace impact on that leg. Because jujitsu wise, you know, especially if I'm taking a quick shot like so, I gotta be able to move in multiple directions and quickly. And that's sometimes hard to replicate if you're just doing static split squats or squats or curls. If you're an athlete and you're trying to rebuild your knee, the elements of your sport, in my opinion, at a certain point in your rehab process have to be reintroduced. And again, I'm no expert. I'm no expert on sports performance or anything like that. But in general, common sense tells me if I want to be able to take impact, I should probably reintroduce impact at some point. Because for example, I could squat in the 400s again, well before I could sprint or well before I could jump because it's two different things. Stabilizing 400 without moving my feet is one thing, 
But now taking my body weight and jumping and landing and being able to do this as a whole other thing, right? And that's another, that's another thing to progress. So in short, I showed you guys pretty much almost everything that I did leading up to where I'm at now and also the roadblocks that I experienced. And I hope this helps give you guys a general blueprint, blueprint to start with, as well as some things to kind of expect along the way, to not freak out, not necessarily resort to surgery right away if you don't need it. Give yourself the chance to experience a lot of these different rehab modalities and see if they work as well for you as they did for me. I hope this helps guys. If you guys wanna see more about my rehab process or my jujitsu or my lifting, you guys can check me out on Instagram at jhouse182 or on YouTube at Jimmy House. Thank you guys.